this episode of Live WPTV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. My name is James Coletti, and this is <coughs> this is the Boston WordPress Meetup. We've been going strong for about three years now, meeting once a month here at Microsoft. Um, usually we have two sessions, but this month we're just going to have one. We try to do one that's like more developer oriented and we try to do a sort of a non -de non developer non coding one this month we only have one we have a genius bar as well and um, some great people over there to serve you all right ken and uh is jerry here <coughs> okay yeah. all right so we're short one genius <laughs> cool so uh, here's a wi-fi code twitter hashtag um, so we have an email address, it's help at bostonwp.org. We have the new bostonwp.org site. Well, it's not so new, but it's it's pretty cool. We have um, forums there. If you have any questions about WordPress, definitely post on the forums. We try to get back to you. Um, anybody in the community can answer that as well. We have a jobs board as well. If you have projects, full-time jo uh, full jobs, project-based things, post them there. So uh, I want to touch base on a little bit uh, about the WordPress camps and classes. Um, James and I are actually teaching a beginner's class March 25th. It's a Friday. It's all day from uh, was it 8 to 6 p.m. Um, it is $215. It's a fundraiser for Boston Chi. Uh, it's computer human interaction. Um, and that price is good until March 12th, and it's going to be 265 thereafter um, after March 12th. So if you guys are interested, take a look on the website, bostonchi.org. Sorry, and uh, WordCamp Boston. So I'm sporting last year's WordCamp Boston shirt. Um, the date has been confirmed. It's it's July 23rd and 24th. Um, we're still working on on the 22nd. The venue hasn't been <coughs> confirmed, but we're very very close. Um, but at least reserve the date. Keep an eye out. Uh, volunteers are needed. Um, you can visit the website WordCampBoston.com. You can follow them on Twitter. WordCamp Boston, or you can email wordcampboston at gmail.com. Likewise, you can also see John is right there. He's going to be the lead organizer this year. Um, and if there are any questions, uh, you know, feel free to visit the sites or, or find John afterwards. If you guys don't know what a WordCamp is, it's like a big event that's sort of created by the automatic the company that the commercial company that backs WordPress. And last year. Last year, um, we had the first one in Boston, and it was great. There were like four to 500 people. It was here. It was a great event. A lot of speakers and a lot of good knowledge transfer and networking sponsorship. So we're doing another one this year. It's going to be bigger and better than last year. Um, and uh, we do have an update on the March meetup. So we have the sessions and uh, the actual topics in place. Um, it's actually going to be one, and it's a WP Frameworks Bake Off. And um, what we want to do, I think it's Alan. Alan wants to uh, compare thesis, headway, and another theme based off of Meetup's recommendation. It could be Genesis. Um, when we send the formal RSVPs out next week, um, we want you guys to send a theme of your choice, and the theme that gets the most votes will be the third theme that uh, he'll go over. We do need volunteers. We're going to break this out into sessions. And so each volunteer or each group should have a clean WordPress site installed with at least one of the themes, um, either thesis, headway, or whatever it may be. And what's going to happen is it's almost going to be like a little, a small little contest. Um, maybe we can try and work up some prizes uh, for next month. But really what, we're, what he wants to do is to see how easy these themes are to use, how can you can imp implement plugins or widgets um, and really take it from the basics to a more functional WordPress site. So it's aimed for everyone from beginners to developers, um, and really it's just going to be a learning tool. Each group will present at the end, you know, what's easy about it and what, what isn't. Also, if you're not familiar with some of these, theme, these themes, uh, thesis headway, they're commercial themes and, and they, they cost money and they're supposed to help you develop sites a lot faster and easier. And if you're not, if you're not sure about, you know, doing code and stuff like that, you're supposed to be able to customize your site. And so we're going to put three of them head to head with some goal and we're going to split up the group and see um, if we can accomplish that and which one is the easiest to work with, hands on. Uh, 
What's, what's the third choice, Gene? We don't know yet. Um, this was suggested by a member. So there's thesis, headway, and we're going to look for a third one. I'm, I'm not sure. It may be a free one. It may be, there's a couple on the table. So s submit your suggestions submit your suggestion on, on Vito. Okay, yeah. I use the ball. I like, I like the ball. We'll submit it. I will. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the date set, March 28th. Um, like I said, we'll send out the formal RSVP next week. Um, and again, there's no toolbox session since this will cover uh, everything from beginners to developers. Um, I think that's it. Um, just wanted to ask you guys, just from a show of hands, who's here for the Genius Bar? Cool. Okay, good to know, mm -hmm. good to know. Um, we have uh, Greg Cornelius here. He's from BU, he's gonna be giving our talk tonight. Um, he's actually going to take over the whole room. So whoever needs help from the Genius Bar, we're going to kindly ask you to step out and we'll visit you in our, our office today, <laughs> out here. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Tonight is to talk about actions and filters, which are the uh, foundation of the WordPress API. Um, so just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Gregory Cornelius. I'm uh, one of the lead developers uh, of the BU CMS at Boston University. I work for Interactive Design, uh, which is uh, a unit within the marketing and communications area. Uh, so we function more or less like an internal ad agency. Uh, so we have a print design side, we have an interactive side, um, there's a photography group. Uh, and so we have uh, joined forces with uh, the uh, with ISMT, uh, which is the uh, Information Services and Technologies group uh, within BU. So we actually work together, which uh, from what I understand is somewhat rare on college campuses. Uh, and and uh, we have uh, a pretty pretty nice little set that we got going. So a couple of other bits about me. You can find me on Twitter at GCRNE. Uh, I have a website and a uh, blog where I post some WordPress stuff. I'm also a composer. Uh, that's my background. I'm one dissertation away from uh, a doctorate in music composition. There's a lot of electronic music in my blood, so uh, I definitely write both code and music and sometimes come out with you. So just a, a quick, pack, quick pat on the back. Uh, the Boston University CMS, it's uh, powered by WordPress multi-site. It's really not true. It's WordPress multi-user uh, version 2.9.2. We're getting ready to do a major upgrade. Um, hosts over 400 university websites, comprises of over 55 themes. Uh, I think we have over 50 custom plugins that do lots of stuff, including uh, site organization, user management, uh, access control lists, uh, custom taxonomies, and uh, ways for managing particular bits of metadata about individual posts and pages. So a few highlights. Let me just jump over to a browser here. Uh, so this is the International Programs website, uh, which I was very involved with. Uh, the one big component of it is how it uses custom taxonomies to organize program information. So each one of these uh, sets of criteria for finding a program is a custom taxonomy. And then these are, this is a list of all the terms within that custom taxonomy. And then you can drill down further and you get a list of programs. When you actually end up on the program page, then we get related media content that's related by the taxonomy and a series of other related programs that are tied to this program by the tagging system. So this is an English speaking program, so I can say, oh, I really wanted to look into other English speaking programs, and I can then just quickly jump and get a, a list involved. Do this a little bit more. We also moved, uh, combined actually this, originally the academics website and the college or this 
the bulletin was a separate website, and actually the bulletin primarily was a print publication. Uh, in the last year, we moved it to the website, and now this is the primary way that students get information about programs and courses. So you can explore it. Uh, again, in, in this particular project, one thing that we had to do was pull in course information from our central data store and integrate that into a WordPress setup. So uh, there was something about something around the lines of 10,000 courses that get pulled in in various ways. Took a bit of work. Uh, another project that I worked on pretty heavily is uh, the Metropolitan College website, which also uses a, a custom taxonomy kind of solution. Uh, this is just a really visually stimulating website, the College of Communication. And another project that also Sue actually, in the second row here. She did the design and I did all the development work for uh, the Center for Global Health and Development, um, which included a large publication section. So we built this browsing tool that kind of iTunes-esque allowed you to uh, find publications. So just a quick showcase of what he is doing with WordPress. Okay, so uh, over the last couple of years of working for BU, I think I've come to realize maybe a bit that uh, I can, if I were to give two pieces of advice to anybody that's wanting to really get into some serious, heavy WordPress development, uh, these would be the two pieces. The first one is really for uh, heavy duty PHP developers. So if, if you spend a lot of time doing PHP, and you're new to WordPress, uh, your first reaction's gonna be like, what is going on here? Because it has a very unique kind of uh, design and style, uh, I think. Especially now that we're uh, in a world that's uh, PHP 5 and all object oriented. WordPress is still runs just fine on PHP 4, well maybe not as fine as it once did, but um, it does work pretty well on PHP 4. Um, and so I think to some degree the style of, PH, of WordPress comes from its background and its history. Um, so all I can say is read the source. So if you know PHP, uh, dig in and read the source. There's nothing that will teach you more about WordPress than the source code. And I'll sh show you some tricks in a bit about how I go about making reading the source easier. And if you're come from the other side of things. So you're someone that fell in love with the, the possibilities of WordPress from a content standpoint, maybe, and, or, or a design standpoint, or you, someone said WordPress is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I recommend that you learn the stack. And what, what do I mean by the stack? Well, uh, WordPress is just one piece of a whole system that, uh, that powers a WordPress website. You have Often uh, it will be Linux, sometimes it will be Windows Server, so that's the operating system. Then you have some sort of HTTP server, uh, usually it will be Apache, it might be Nginx, it might be uh, IIS if it's a Windows Server. Uh, then there's the language PHP, and then there's the database server, MySQL. Uh, throw in some Bash, you know, why not learn a bit of Python, definitely some JavaScript. You know, dig in, it, it's only going to help you. And not only is it only going to help you, but in the end, once you start digging into it, you might find that you don't want to be just a WordPress person. You want to be someone that is uh, a little bit, you know, you can do more things. You, you can uh, really do, uh, it, it's, it's, it's to your benefit. Okay, so after my sort of two golden rules, uh, let's jump into what really is an action or a filter. So these, this is the, the core WordPress. Uh, action filter is a callback system, and it's really the primary API through which WordPress developers do work. So, uh, it's, 
when I say API, it's something that all of the core WordPress developers, they know that you're going to be using this. It's written for you to use. It's, it's something that is going to be thought about because its whole purpose is really for you to use it. So it's not going to change dramatically. Um, it, it, it will change, but it, hopefully they're not going to just pull the rug right out from under you. So the more that you're using this method uh, for doing your work, the less likely you're going to have your plugin break when, it, when an upgrade happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, the, the whole notion of a callback system is it's, it's just a great way to give others the power to extend our code in context that we don't know about yet. So by providing a mechanism for someone to inject a callback into the execution of your code, then you're allowing them to do something that you never even would have imagined they would have even wanted to do. So it's, it's really a, a kind of a powerful thing that's been around for a long time. So what's a, what's a callback? Uh, this is just straight little PHP script. Uh, we just have a couple functions. The main function, which is calling. We have the, the PHP call, call user func, and then a uh, name of a function, and then an argument. Uh, when that first line fires, it goes, runs main, and then calls the callback, which takes that argument, hello world, goes through and echoes it out. So I, uh, I just, you know, this is simple stuff, but I, for completeness, I wrote it up. And I'll show you the script. So here's the little script. When I run it, um, it's great to run stuff at the command line. So it's just a handy way to, to run a little PHP and, and see what it's going to do. So I run the script. I get, oh, this is small. So anyway, at the very bottom here, you can see <laughs> Hello World <coughs> being printed out to uh, the standard output. Um, OK. So one of the beauties of the action callback, or the action filter system within WordPress is that it's really simple. There's only a few, uh, a few functions that you need to know about to be able to understand most of what's going on. So there's a series of functions related to filters. We have add filter, apply filters, apply filters, wrap array, and a, and a series of functions that relate to actions. Um, so really kind of tidy, and that's something that that's, uh, I, I enjoy. So let's just jump in and uh, talk about an action. So the action, as the name suggests, is about doing something and doing something at a particular point in time. So we have a callback that is called at a particular point in the life cycle of, uh, of the request. Um, and when does that get, when does that happen? We have do action, which is, this is going to fire the callback. And then the handle is, uh, is the name of, uh, of the key in a, an associative array that's going to hold a series of callbacks. They're going to all be attached to that handle. And then, optionally, there can be some arguments that get passed through the callback at the, at the point that it gets called. Uh, then we have the second little bit, which is how we attach the callback to the handle. So the second thing, I, so I have. Uh, an action that's going to be have a handle of foo. Um, the second line, I would add an action foo, and then the name of a function, um, and then there's a couple of optional parameters, which I'll get into in a second. And then the third line there is a way to, to remove an action. So say someone else has attached an action to a particular handle, and I don't like that that action's going to fire. I want to get rid of it, because I'm further down in the, the tree. I just remove that action um, using the third one. So let's do some code. <coughs> All right. So just kind of 
explain my setup here. I um, we're going to be working within a functions.php file that is a part of a child theme of the 2010 theme. So I have a very kind of simplest setup just to focus on the code. I've taken um, let me show here. So I have uh, I have the 2010 theme here. So it's got all of the the different templates and, and all of its functionality and style sheets and, and images and whatnot. I just took and copied this the style sheet, um, added this line here, template, colon, 2010. This means make this a child theme of the 2010 theme. So it's going to inherit all of the files, uh, the template files from 2010. Um, and then I just copied in their style sheet. So I, I, I'm not doing anything design-wise special. I'm just using this as a vehicle to add some code to it. Um, and then uh, I'm adding in my functions.php file. One kind of unique thing about child themes is that functions.php is one of the files that actually uh, both files run. So when, and I'll show this a little bit later, but um, the functions.php file in 2010 will run as well as this one. Like I said, I'll show that in a minute. Okay, so <clears throat> before we even get into the set of all the different possible actions and filters that WordPress um, makes available, let's just learn how this little API works. So I uh, copied over the footer and stripped out some of the, uh, the uh, WordPress, powered by WordPress stuff. But I'm just going to add in a little A little uh, action here. So so at its, at, at its most basic level, I just define this this um, handle, GC footer action. I, I'm using GC as a way of kind of name spacing this so that it's, uh, it's you know it's unlikely that someone else is going to name it the same and cause some sort of conflict. Um, so I'll save that. And then in, in functions.php here, I'm going to just create a callback. I'll use the same namespace. And then uh, <coughs> I need to do something. So. So in this case, we're just going to throw out a paragraph with this lovely thank you. Um, and then now I have to attach the callback to the handle. So I add an action and then attach it to that to that handle. So that was GC footer action. And then uh, we need the callback to pass that as a string. So this is really <coughs> pretty straightforward, simple stuff. But okay. So this is the little demo site that I'm, I'm working with here. And we get down to the footer. And now we have this little message. Very simple. I can also explore some of the other aspects of the API if I want. I open up the footer again here. I can say Okay, so what did action what it does it takes the name of a, of a handle or a hook and uh, it goes and figures out how many times that action is, or that uh, hook has fired and then reports back and says, uh, 
fired so many times. So in this case, that action only fired, there was only one callback attached to the, the action. It fired one time and output the one. Not very useful in this context, but. Okay, so that's just very simple little action. So let's switch over to filter. So filter is, has a slightly different purpose generally. Uh, a filter is a callback that takes a piece of data and then processes that piece of data and returns it. Um, and sort of in the spirit of Photoshop or some other sort of uh, tool where you might apply a series of filters all to the same data, and then just the data flows from one filter to another to another, and then once it ends, reaches the end of the chain, then it carries on with its business and, and you uh, use the data somehow. So uh, it's just before we get into a, a demonstration of that, just very important to stay organized when you're uh, writing code, especially if anybody else is going to read it. And if you don't think anybody else is going to read it, well, you're probably going to read it like a year later. So uh, you want to stay organized. Um, so always try to use an appropriate name for your callback so that you know what it's going to do. And I strongly recommend registering your actions and filters close to their callbacks because then you can see, okay, I have declared this callback and I've attached it uh, to this hook. Um, and it just makes it very easy to read. Um, so back to uh, my... ID here, let's jump into some filters. So in this case, I'm gonna just start to get into, well, what are some of the, the hooks that WordPress makes available? I mean, in the first example, I defined my own hook. I, I created an action um, using the do action and then attached something to that action and then the two were linked up. Well, in this case, I want to I want to do something using uh, some of the hooks that, that WordPress makes available, um, and it's just an opportunity for me to show you kind of how I work a little bit. Uh, so, what we're going to do first is go back to rule number one, which is uh, dig into the source. I've dug into the source and found that all of this stuff is defined in WP includes WP includes slash plugin dot So uh, just open that file up. And one thing you'll notice, WordPress does. And this is something that's changed since I started working with WordPress. They've made a really strong effort to use PHP documenter notation um, on top of every function and class throughout the source code. It's great because uh, I can browse the code and read what the developers think about what something's doing. So um, now I can look here. I'm looking at the add filter stuff. I mean, it's very detailed stuff. It talks about exactly what a filter is, a uh, bunch of, of, of interesting information. But what I really want to get into is the actual um, doing of the work, which is the apply filter. So what happens is throughout the source code, there are instances where apply filters is called with a hook. And I want to know, uh, you know, what are all the hooks that fire over the course of a regular request? So uh, you, know, you don't want to do this on a live site, but this is my little sandbox. So let's just let's just see. So I'm just editing for. You know, I'm not going to publish this live. Or Gonna, whoops, that. Just gonna throw an error log message. It's gonna be uh, just throw out what the name of this filter is that's firing. And uh, there's another way that one can fire a filter that apply filter and wrap around do the same basically. So this doesn't the way that I the way that I have this set up. It's not actually going to tell me um, 
whether there was any callback attached. So it's just going to go through all the different attempts at firing filters. Um, so I now have that uh, loaded up. Let's give me one second to make this fire. So I'll just load this page here and we'll get a bunch of output. So what's, what's happened here, this is an indication of how much, how many hooks there are in WordPress and how often they fire. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> Still scrolling. I could have, I could have, uh, do something a bit more easy to parse out. A lot of them are the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. I, I mean, I, anyway, uh, I'll just, for the sake of it. That's how, many, that's how many things you can change about that single page load. Yeah, yeah, system. if you think of it that way, I mean, you can basically turn WordPress into a Frankenstein if you want, and you did a little bit too much of that, I think, but, um, but it's, it's nonetheless, I mean, it's, uh, it's powerful, this whole API. Okay. Uh, I'm just showing that you can redirect the output of the tail into a file. And, uh, and you can look at it, and I can search for different things like. So then the other aspect of this is if you're using Subversion, um, and I can go into this a little bit more, but um, I can then just revert my modifications. Um, so I have a checkout of core, so that tells me, um, maintains the, the state of the source code for me, and then I can just revert it and pull, get rid of all of my changes. I've done my little test, I've proven that there's a huge amount that happens. There's a lot of filters. So, cool. Okay. So the kind of first filter that most people make is a, a filter of the content. Um, and this time I'm just going to copy some code because it's saving a bit of time. So let's uh, just take this bit. So this is a very simple filter. Here's my callback. Uh, it's the content filter. I'm going to apply it, apply it to the content. This time, with a filter, you're always going to have at least one argument because you have data that's got to come in, right? So in this case, um, the callback is going to receive some content, and then I can manipulate the content, and I have to return the content, or otherwise I've just basically destroyed the content, <laughs> which might be fun. Um, so in this case, I have it set up with a little conditional. It says, is single, which means, is it a, a single post? If so, add this disclaimer. Um, she says, the views expressed above are my own. Actually, they're not, but. So uh, I have to go and look at a single post here, and you can see that I've added content to the content. Okay. So let's add another content filter to show how these things can be changed. Oh, 
Okay. So here's a, a second filter. Um, function name, still taking the content. This time I'm adding a uh, email link. It says, please email the author if you have any questions. Um, and the question becomes, which one of these will be applied first? Uh, any, uh, what will be the answer? Anybody, uh, I always forget if it's bigger first or smaller first. So the way it works is the priority, the higher the priority, so the, the third argument to add filter is the priority. So how, how uh, important is it? And uh, it starts with the smallest and then goes to the largest. The default priority is 10. So if I take and strip away this one here, I can strip away the last two arguments. Um, it would, uh, I didn't actually need them because they were the defaults. Uh, which is 10 and then one argument. Um, so in this case, this one has a priority of 10, and this one has a priority of 12. So when I make sure I say when I load my page here, the one with the priority of 10 appears below the one with the priority of 12. So I can make that one one. Load and now change the order of execution. So priorities are really powerful, uh, and there's some instances where you can do more than you realize you can do once you realize that you can use priorities to change the order of stuff. For example, in the head of uh, the theme, there's a call so called uh, WP underscore head. It's an action, and uh, WordPress uses that action to spit out scripts. Um, there's a, uh, I can, I'd have to look it up, it's something like print script. Or something. And it, it's registered with a priority of nine, I think. And if I want to do something to what it's going to print out, I need to r register my action as a, at a priority of one or two or something other than nine. Um, and what that allows me to do is actually add scripts to the footer. Uh, and I use this all the time in, in themes. I can actually show you an example with the mobile stuff real quick. So here's uh, an instance of this. So I have I'm adding an action to WP head. Um, I've namespaced a lot, a lot of this stuff with BU mobile. Uh, I'm calling it BU head because that's where it's happening. And what I'm doing is I'm queuing a couple scripts here. Uh, a modernizer script, which is great if you're dealing with mobile, highly recommended. And then another bit of custom stuff I wrote. Um, and what's great about it in QScript is it handles all of the dependencies. So in this case, I uh, pass in array jQuery, which means that my script requires require jQuery. So it's going to automatically load jQuery in the head using the, the version of jQuery that ships with WordPress. Um, and I don't even need to tell it to. It just, it just does it because it's a dependency. Um, and then I can I pass in some version numbers. And then this last bit here just says put it in the footer, which is a good thing for uh, JavaScript because you want to execute the JavaScript after you've rendered the page um, because it will perform better because you'll, you'll get the, the visitor will get the content faster, and then it will do um, you know your special special sauce. Um, anyway, so I, I use the priority of one to be able to enqueue the script ahead of. Uh, the, the internal WordPress stuff. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do what I just did. It's just a quirk. Um, okay. Is there any questions? 
questions? Yeah. Well, uh, so far, your content examples are something a lot of people would want, but they might think uh, to put it in the theme instead, because you could just edit those, uh, the single.php file. Right. To add those things. Why would you use this way instead? Well, just because I, well, first of all, I would never hard code content into uh, my code. It just isn't really a good idea. But I could have this be pulling content from a meta box or from some other place in my WordPress admin. So maybe I made an admin screen that was like author info screen, or maybe I'm taking author information. And I just want to add it to the bottom of, of uh, a single post. So I could just as easily add some other code in here that was pulling the author information and displaying that author information underneath uh, the post. And what's great about that is I didn't have to touch the parent theme. So I saved myself, you know, by using a child theme, I, I, I don't have to do all of this work. Someone else already did tons and tons of work to come up with a really elegant way of, of laying out and building the, the, uh, the theme. And I can just jump in real quick and add this and, you know, just because the client or Someone decided that in this case we want something a little different. Well, here, stop. Uh, and uh, once you get really quick with it, I mean, this, it takes minutes just to do that too. So. You also, if there's an update to the theme, you can update it in the background, and this will continue working. Yeah, yeah, that's even system. better. Another point, which is, yeah, you paid for a theme, right? So you have some sort of, you know, you. you purchase a theme or it's a third party theme and they update it regularly, you just make a child theme of it. When you know it updates automatically, something like this, it's not going to do anything to the theme. The only thing you have to be careful of is make sure it's styled, but you're not touching anything that's going to cause the theme to break. And you know, it, it upgrades happen naturally. It's really a handy thing. You can also go in other places for content show. Uh, like the content filter gets run on RSS. So when someone looks at a post in RSS, if you add the content this way, it'll be in the bottom of the RSS post, whereas if it was in the theme, it wouldn't show up. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. And that's something that actually you have to be really careful about with some of these things, and which is all, one of the reasons why I showed how many times uh, these, these different, especially with filters. Filters will be used many times in the same request, often, I mean, especially the most common ones. Um, and so you just have to be careful. But that's true of actions, too, a little bit, especially on the admin side. Okay. Back to so another calling reference. Uh, okay, so quick tip. Um, I already kind of mentioned that for when I'm developing plugins, it's very, very helpful to have a, 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 a tool that gives me a clean slate to go back to. Because then I can write code and do all kinds of things, and I don't have to feel like I have to remember everything that I did. Because I can just always go back, or I can compare and see, oh, I made those changes. Oh, yeah, I did that last week. Or, you know, I got interrupted. I can, I can it's easy to, to do. Uh, so, like I showed before, I can easily revert my debugging code. Uh, I can. Uh, review core changes, so this is kind of cool. You want to see really uh, some behind the scenes action. Um, what would be a, let's use, uh, that's a good one, that's a good one, okay, default filters. Let's see how default filters have changed in the last however many iterations here. So I can just say, by the way, I'm using a, a, a development environment called NetBeans, but um, I could be doing this at the command line. There's lots of tools out there. So I just uh, just look through the history. Some of these, if you're someone that's really follows the developer community, these names should be really familiar. Uh, Mark Jaquiz, um, he does uh, the video quick tag stuff, and um, he's responsible for that's Viper. No, Viper, right? No, oh, sorry. Anyway. I just screwed up. Okay, but anyway, familiar names. <laughs> uh, and you can see what actually they were committing. I can 
uh, do a dip. It takes a little while to pull down the changes. Subversion is not fast. That's one thing that's really annoying. But we um, just get it. So anyway, I can just jump through changes. Um, so you know, when you're really, really digging into it, it, it can be really helpful. And it, it, you actually start to develop a relationship with the code when, when you track and see what's going on. Okay. Uh, another handy trick is I can switch between different versions of WordPress, all with just one command line um, command called SVN switch. Um, and then the last thing is once you become familiar with all this, uh, if you're just one tiny little step away from contributing and reviewing patches to uh, WordPress. <coughs> Okay, I don't need to do that. Okay, uh, let's give others a chance to play. So, really where the power of these actions and filters come in is how can I use them not to build a plugin, but to make my plugin extensible. So someone else can extend it and, and, and use it in a way that you didn't even know that they wanted to use it in. The same with your theme. How, so how do, I, how do I go about that? Um, so, by incorporating them into your plugins and themes, you give developers downstream the ability to modify behavior. And unlike attempting to call an undefined function, so a lot of times you'll see uh, instances where a developer will say, just add this into your theme. You know, just put this function call into your theme, and then uh, it will do something. Well, if they instead said, put this do action into your theme, and then it will do something, if you deactivate the plugin, it won't break. Um, whereas if I have a function call and it just said something like uh, display video, and I stuck that into my theme, and WordPress doesn't have a function named display video. So when PHP executes, it will get to display video, and it'll say, oh, that's not defined. We're done. Fatal error. End of game. Um, whereas if I would have said do action and then a handle display video, and uh, the plugin then just added an action to that. When it was executing, oh, well, I deactivated the plugin, so it just didn't attach that callback to that handle. Nothing would happen. It would just carry on. It wouldn't display any video, but it would just carry on executing. You wouldn't have any ill effects. So uh, it's a really powerful kind of deal. Um, and another way to kind of think about this is how of the hierarchy of code gets loaded. And I'm talking really of the third party code and how um, you know, a theme might want to modify a plugin or a child theme might want to modify a parent theme or a child theme might want to modify a plugin. Um, and so the order in which these, the code is, is loaded becomes important. So uh, non-core, so your third party code is loaded in the following order. It starts with MU plugins, um, which if you're not aware of MU plugins, this is a great way to add custom code uh, behind the scenes without the clients having to, without having to worry that the client's going to deactivate the plugin, because MU plugins, they always execute every time, and there's no way to turn them on and off unless you write it in your code. Um, and then if we're dealing with the multi-site installation, which I'm always dealing with, uh, plugins that are activated across the entire network. Um, and then we get into individual blog slash site activated plugins. Then we load the current theme, functions.php. And then, and actually I think I may have this backwards. Uh, no, that's right. We load the current theme, functions.php, and then we learn, load the parent theme. So that's how the current theme, the, the, the child theme, can override behavior in the parent theme. For example, if you have constants that are defined in the parent theme, you could define them in the child theme ahead of them being defined in the parent theme. Yeah. So, when the MU stands for must use plugins, that's the, that's that's the, what the, the name of the acronym. Yeah. yeah, it was supposed to be, they came from the multi user side, and uh -huh. then they decided, oh, well, if we just call them must use, then we don't have to change the folder. <laughs> and, and then, you're going to talk about init? 
Uh, I can. Yeah. And it's one of the most used hooks, which happens after all of this stuff. Because mm. most, if your plugin is going to do anything, you can put the PHP right in your uh, site activated plugin, like just a normal plugin file, and it'll fire before the parent theme functions.php and stuff. But you're never actually supposed to do that. You're only supposed to define your functions and then attach them to a hook somewhere. And so you, usually you use init, which is the like core, uh, WordPress is ready, everything is gonna work normally, so actually do stuff at that point. Like you might define an object with, with methods and stuff, but you don't initialize it until init usually. Just to, so that, because for example, if you do something in your plugin, there's a lot of functions that won't work. Like you won't be able that, to that's get true, but, but the plugin API is something that is available from the beginning, so actually I, I don't like to put all of the uh, uh, attaching of callbacks to hooks in some in another hook, just because it's harder to read from, unless I have to, um, because the the plugin um, API will be loaded early enough, and I, they're not going to change that. So this is just another kind of illustration. So we have the core, and then you have a plugin and then you have a theme and then you maybe have a child theme. Um, okay, so what this is, what we're talking about by adding actions and filters to a theme or a plugin is we're creating an API through which others can interact with our plugin or our theme. And so um, it's a good idea to think about well, what makes a good API. Uh, and this came from, I, uh, presentation by a Google uh, employee. They're usually good to follow. Um, and I didn't go through and give all of the tips, but you want, to, you want it to be easy to use. You want it to make sense. So you want it, it this really comes down to nomenclature and naming and, and those sort of things. Uh, you want it to be really simple, uh, you know, as simple as you can, but you don't want it to make it so simple that you're limiting functionality. You want it to be consistent, so once you've added this API to your plugin and it's out in the world and people are using it, you can't change the API. Well, you can, but you're going to have to be willing to deal with the ramifications of making that change because other, you know, lots of people are going to start using it to do stuff. And once they start using it and then you pull the rug out from under them, potential for bad things to happen. Um, and then it's also really good for the rest of your code. And this is something that I have definitely found, which is that by thinking about incorporation of APIs into my code, my code ends up being better. Um, and the reason is, is that you, you're thinking about a more modular kind of code, and you're thinking about ways to uh, how you handle and um, kind of hide information and, and how you expose information. Um, and especially if you write using PHP 5 and objects, you can really, really make this very elegant. Okay. So, I'm going to dig in even deeper, write some more code. Um, in this case, if you have a laptop and you want to grab the code, I posted uh, this little widget on GitHub, and uh, the link's right here. Okay. So this is like some almost useful stuff. Uh, so let's just take a look at this. Okay. So I this is uh, a regular plugin that adds a widget to the widget inventory. Um, in this case, it's sort of, it's a widget that is sort of like the, the uh, recent post widget that comes with WordPress, but it has a bit of more of an API that allows you to control how it's displayed. Um, in this case, I'm adding just four little filters that allow me to, to manipulate this plugin from a theme in this case, um, I have one that says modern post visibility. So let's test how good my API is. What do you think the 
that modern post visibility will do. Oh, makes sense. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. I was worried. <laughs> okay, the second one, modern post title. How are we going to deal with the title? Modern post query args. Um, how we're going to form the query and then a template. Okay. So uh, this is following the, the normal widget API that was came out in, in WordPress 2.8. Um, and I'll just jump around a little bit here. So the form, which is here, so the, the, the form and update have to do with the admin side. So this here is what's setting up um, what my admin control is going to look like. Um, and one practice that I follow is to try to separate my interface from the code that's doing work. So in this case, I have a separate file that has the interface. And I can I do. I just, I don't know why I'm relaxing too much of that. Okay. So this just here, I just, just to show, this, the idea of separating the interface from the code to some degree is that I could pass this off as a designer and it would look a bit more like what they would expect. It looks like a little snippet of HTML and they could add, you know, modify uh, bits of it. Uh, without having to understand all of the, the details of what's going on. Okay. So let's just get into the actual part that's displaying. Because, uh, before I do that, I get, I'll switch to uh, just show you what this looks like on the admin side. So this is the control for it. I have a title for it. I can add a, a, a link that surrounds the title. I can choose a category. Um, I don't have a bunch of categories. In this. I can say how many of the how many posts I want to, to show, um, just to compare. This is the one that comes with WordPress. So this is just very simple. I don't, I can't limit it to a category, at least not to the uh, admin, and it just has a title. So it's a little bit more functionality to it. Okay. And then uh, this method here, widget, this is what's going to display my widget. So when I load a page, it's going to uh, go find, you know, uh, when I'm it's generating a sidebar. If my widget is in the sidebar. It's going to run this code and, uh, and display the widget. Um, so this is really where most of the work is happening. Uh, so first thing, I have my first filter here using the five filters. And I have uh, the handle, which is modern post visibility. And then the data that I'm dealing with is just a Boolean, whether it's true or false. And then for the sake of helping out the person that might be using this API, I'm also giving them the instance. So that, that's, the instance contains things like the title of that widget. So if I wanted to target a widget that had a particular title, or if I wanted to target a widget that had a particular category, or uh, something along those lines, that's exposed through this array that is the instance. Um, and then simply, if it's false, then we just, we're done. We don't do anything. Nothing gets displayed. Um, this is just a line to, if, if for some reason the instance uh, doesn't have all of the, uh, the different uh, arguments defined in it, I 
parse it against my set of defaults. So this is sort of in there for future proof. So I add a new a new uh, parameter to to uh, the widget, and this will set the default to it automatically without any user interaction. So I'm pulling out the title there, uh, doing a default, uh, creating a link around the title. And then here, uh, here's where I'm applying a filter to the title. Again, this one's very straightforward. It's just passing the data in the instance and letting you do something to it. So um, something that I could do is say, change the title based on what category uh, the, uh, the admin is set to. So I could include the category in the title somehow. So then I have a line here that calls another method in my widget that builds the query. Um, and I separated this out actually just because um, I could extend this widget. I could create another widget that extends this widget and that maybe does everything the same except for it builds the query differently and maybe there's a little form field. Like maybe I wanted to change it so that, it, that I'm selecting tags rather than categories. And I didn't want to have to duplicate all this code. So by separating out the build query, I, I'm able to just uh, override that one method in my subplot. Okay. And again, here I have filter that allows me to filter the query args and I pass it the instance. So we we'll see a pattern. Um, now I'm building a, a query, so I'm creating an object based on WP query using those args. And then this is the probably the most powerful little bit, which is that I'm gonna take and rather than doing some sort of WordPress loop right here, I'm going to use a template to actually do the WordPress loop. So I'm going to pass, take, and apply a filter called modern post template. I'm going to pass it nothing, because at this point, I don't have content. I'm going to give it a reference to the query that I created. And I'm going to pass it the instance information, should I need it. Um, and just in case they don't actually reset the post data, I'll just do it for them. Because that's something I've been known to forget. So, <laughs> okay. And then uh, if if I have output, then I uh, echo out the before widget, the after widget, my title if it, if, it, if if there's content in it, and the body of my widget. So. In order for this to work without any, um, you know, without the, a child being defining the template, I provide a default template. Um, and I do that by adding a static method of template that might, in this instance, I didn't need the instance argument. So I just have the content of the query, and I have a very simple WordPress loop where the query has posts. I create a, a UL while the query has posts. I create a list item with the post information using a link to the permalink and grabbing the title and throwing it in. And then I have to add that filter to the template. And you'll notice that I do this actually outside of my widget. And the reason why I do this is kind of twofold. One is that um, you know, when I show the loading of that code, this filter will get added pretty early on, meaning that all kinds of code will be able to remove it. Now, any theme, another plugin, and there's so many opportunities to remove this filter. Uh, I also set its priority very high, so it's the first one on the stack. So if I if I if I just by default created another filter, it was going to come after this, and I would be able to blow this one away. There would be no issues. This, this is so easy to override. <laughs> it's very hard not to override it. Um, okay. So 
What do I get? I mean, the voice that you now believe the uh, problem. If you had it inside the object instead, you could still override it pretty easily. Because up until it actually displays on the front end, someone could remove that action. Yeah, yeah, but you know, the other thing that will happen with a filter is that you can attach a bunch of them. Yeah. So each instance of the widget is attaching filters as opposed to the way I'm doing it, I'm attaching just one time, and uh, it applies to every instance. Mm. Okay, so maybe, yeah. Um, okay, so this is my default behavior. I have a list of the most recent posts, um, and it appears on every, every page. I didn't, I'm not manipulating the visibility in any way on the home page and then on the home page is kind of silly because it's the same stuff on the home page on the left as it is on the right. And uh, the one thing I did do on the single, you know, when I was building the query, I did do a little trick to show you. I uh, did if, if I'm displaying a single post, I take the post ID of the post that I'm that I'm displaying and I add it to uh, one of the query args, post not in, so that it gets stripped out. Um, and I just, you know, so I don't have that duplication where I have, I have my, my article or my post, and it's not just, it's not on the side. Just, I don't know, kind of like that. Okay, so that's all well and dandy, but let's take a look and see how we can then take this child theme and, and do more interesting stuff with it by overriding the, the template. Okay. So first, let's just remove the filter. Um, another nice thing about using a static method like that, it requires PHP 5, by the way, to use that static method. This plugin requires PHP 5. But it, it makes it really easy to read um, and easy to remove the filter. So I can, it's, it just, this looks nicer to me than having an array where I'm passing in an instance, uh, an object, an instance of the, of the class, and then the method. I mean, it's just, to me, it reads a little nicer. So now I've removed it, and just to kind of prove something, I, nothing breaks, right? I mean, I removed the, the template so I have no content, but nothing broke. So I think that that's one really kind of nice thing about this whole system. Okay, but let's, let's, uh, let's do something more exciting. Okay, so I wrote a little, little bit of right here that creates a different template. So the other thing that I kind of like about how I set this up is that the loop is something that most people are familiar with. The only thing that's a little bit unique to how this is set up is that I'm not outputting the content immediately, I'm passing it back. So I have to constantly append the content that I'm creating to this variable content in this case and then pass that back. Because I'm doing, I'm, this is a filter, I'm taking data, manipulating the data, and returning the data. So in this case, I just, to be different, I'm putting it inside of a div, a post, I am creating a little bit more complicated template. I have the date in here, I'm using a heading to be all SEO friendly, and, uh, and popping in the title. Um, and now I have to also add this. So 
now now I get um, a widget that that maybe in this case is more along the lines of what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it has uh, the date of the, of the post and then the title and the titles of it. Um, and I can take this another step by uh, adding a filter to the visibility. So maybe maybe I only want to show this on pages. So now I changed how this is working, and instead of it showing up on the home page, which was not working for me, and in this case I decided I also didn't want it on the single post, now it's only showing when, when it's a page. Um, so I've now added, like, it doesn't feel, you know, just, it gives all these kind of little subtle things that make the site feel more human. So, there's something to be said for them. Any questions about it? Can you show us the, uh, because the templates one, that's really interesting. That's an unconventional usage, I think, that to, to set it out, like, can you show us the, just the other one where, where you can use that again? In the plugin definition? Oh, in the plugin definition, right, okay. Right, so I have, here. So I'm applying a filter. The name of the filter is modern post template. I'm passing it at this point in the chain. I'm starting from nothing and I'm just going to build up stuff. So the chain starts from an empty string and then I add to it. Um, so if you've had two uh, callbacks running on that filter, you have the output would be double effectively. Could be. They each it depends on how I handle the input data. So, you know, maybe what I want, let's add another one here. Yo, because you start fresh with content. Because you clear content. In, in this case, I did. Yeah. But it wouldn't have to. I mean. but that would, in this case, that would be a good policy because you're not proposing that anyone use multiple filters. Well, they could. Well, I'll, here's an example of how you might. If you filter the results, okay. Then. Yeah, I mean, maybe I just want to have a view all link. Yeah. Yeah. So here I could do that. Uh, or you want to make sure code is activated. I don't need the query actually. I can just take my content and append it to it and just say, uh, this is a case where maybe I wanted to, I probably should have pulled out the category, um, but for now I'm, I'm just going to make it. Okay, so now I'm just adding to it. In this case, this is where the priority comes into play. Um, if two things have the same priority, it depends on when they're attached. So in this case, because this is 
the first one is being attached first, and it will run first. Um, so the view all will happen at the end. Um, if I wanted to be more explicit about it, I'd make that 11. Um, but I could make it go, you know, I could add it at the beginning, make this 9. So really, you should probably have a whole other filter for that. That filters the entire output, separate from the template filter. Why? Because in the second one, you're using it as a standard filter, whereas in the other one, it's almost like they could, like filters and actions are the same thing, right? Like in the end, they actually are, this is just a name to define what you expect people to do with them. And so if anything, yeah. you could have a filter for a modern hosts template where what you give it is the name of the callback function, and then that gets filtered. And that would be the more like uh, semantically appropriate way to do it because you're not actually filtering anything with your filter. You're building up some content the and defining what the callback would be. The thing is, there is a difference between an action and a filter. An action never returns data. Yeah, but really, a, a filter is just an action that returns. Like, they're, they're very similar. Right, I mean, yeah, but they're, they're both yeah. callbacks. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I started with the callbacks because they're fundamentally but, but you see how you could just have given it, if you only wanted one thing, you could give it the name of the function that you, you were going to use for the template, yeah. filter that, so then they just pass a different function name. That lets you enforce that there should only be one template function. And then separately, you give it a filter for the whole HTML so that they can do things like add a view all link at the end once it's been created. Yeah. Not that what you did was necessarily wrong, but yeah, that way no, it would be a little easier. I can actually understand. show you I, I, did, and I, I was planning on showing you um, an instance of where I've done something sort of like this within our CMS, with, except for the difference is that there's a filter that defines all of the different uh, formats, which are templates, that, ha that uh, is like a little data structure that has uh, a name for each format and the callback that's used for the format and, and whether it requires commenting be enabled, stuff like that. And then, um, so you so themes can add or remove formats, and then the callback is not using either actions or filters. It's just my own callback uh, using just regular PHP to actually uh, generate the, the markup. Anyway, but any other questions? Does it make sense? Is it cool? That's stupid. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so I took this. I'm going to just remove this. What we just did. And. Uh, just to show another style to this, I uh, wrote a little class. Okay, so I created a little class. Um, it has a helper function for handling the date um, that uses the date format that's stored as a user setting. Um, and then I have a, a little, it's not a great excerpt generator, but it does make an excerpt. And then a template that uses the excerpt. So in this case, I have a static method that's publicly exposed. And it takes the content and the query and uh, makes a uh, now that, you know, it goes through the query, and this time though it takes and puts the excerpt and the date in. So, uh, just show what that looks like. Oops. <laughs> also copying in. So 
So now I have uh, same widget, but with title, a date, and an excerpt for each post. So you use so much plug-in code that you could have written a new widget. That's true, but I didn't have to. And, you know, one of the things that kind of happens within our setup is just that sort of different people are responsible for different things. And um, by being, making this available at the level of a theme to do something, I mean, this is way more complicated than it's necessary. It allows us to have one plugin that everyone uses. So, you know, we have a team of like 20 people that do theme development and plugin development and support and all that sort of stuff. We have this, a user base of a thousand users. Uh, we have a, a user base of a thousand users, right? And you want to write the support documentation to use a single widget. So we have just one view post widget that is used to create a list of recent posts. But a theme designer might say, oh, I want my, my recent posts to look this way. Well, you don't want to have to recreate a new widget for each time you want it to look differently because you want the end users to have just a single set of documentation that works across the board, but you want to allow the flexibility for designers to say, oh, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And this kind of approach allows for that setup. So uh, from the end user, they're just adding a set of, uh, of recent posts, but um, the display is, to some extent, controlled by the person that created the theme. Any other questions, comments? Uh, so, it's just a, a list of really useful uh, resources. This resource here, um, somehow it didn't turn out at the link in my presentation. Um, just pull it up because I think it's a great resource for uh, So what Adam has created is a database of all of the different actions and hooks as, as they exist throughout the various versions of WordPress. So you can see all of the new hooks that have been added in 3.1. Um, so things related to the admin bar, which is new in, ver in version 3.1, um, some of the other stuff. Uh, it's also Yeah, yeah. He also <laughs> has a graph of the number of hooks that have been added over. Anyway, it's it's a useful resource, I think. Um, Copy the new uh, debug bar plugin. Right. That, yeah. that has some good hook related You know, I haven't used it because we run 5.1.6 and there's a uh, I just haven't hacked it. It doesn't run. In, it has to be 5.2 and higher. Yeah, yeah. A lot of shit is 5.2. In case you send OS. Guys, there's six. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a sad state, but. Yeah. Um, by the way, just a, a few things about why I think that something like. Net beams is a really good thing when you're developing a WordPress. There's so much, you know, the WordPress uh, set of code is, it's, there's so much code, and being able to really navigate around the code is, is uh, really handy. So, for example, with the way that this is set up, I can just have my cursor on, uh, on a symbol, and with one keystroke, I can end up at the, the declaration of that class and be 
looking at that class and then navigate back with another keystroke. It's very handy. Um, it's hard to set it up for that. Huh? It's hard to set it up. No, that, I mean, it does that. And you just need to learn the keystroke. Yeah. There are a lot of keystrokes. You need to change the keystrokes to make them decent. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's okay. And when you want to find a filter, it is free, yeah. If you go to a function and you were like, how can I change this in the core? You just go to something like uh, the category. And you're like, how can I change the output of the category? You just start, like, do the thing where you type and then it predicts the symbol. You know the keystroke for that? Yeah, the yeah. Symbol. So, you know, like, the like you said, the category. So here's uh, here's the uh, definition for the category, and then you can just start browsing backwards, and you can get to where you see, oh, here's a filter, a plot filter is the category. Hmm, maybe I need to use that. Um, anyway, because there's always, there's almost always for common tasks filters and actions available in almost any template tag, especially. The tags are using inside the theme, there's already filters available, you just have to find them. You can also look on the codex. There's yeah, but the codex is often... It doesn't have everything, but it has the big ones. It has a lot of big examples. It does have a lot of the big ones. But the source is the best reference. Yeah, and I, I think it just, you know, it's, it's a great way to really learn. I mean, rather than copying and pasting someone else's code, you're able to really understand the code because you're reading and you're writing, um, not copying. Copying, just you don't learn from copying. You learn from reading and writing. Uh, any other questions? So just to kind of give you a sense of how we use something very similar to this, uh, Take you behind the scenes to uh, one of the sandboxes, running the Metropolitan website, um, Metropolitan College website. The internet's it's very slow. Who's down? Who's using BitTorrent? So, uh, this is a little bit more advanced version of, though I, I think there's some things I did in the, in the little demonstration <coughs> widget that are maybe a little nicer, but um, this is what we use in our CMS. And uh, these formats are different templates that are uh, that can be, the, the set of formats can be overrided at, at the level of the theme and added to. And, uh, and then that allows administrators the ability to, to change uh, the look of their post widget within a set of constraints that are controlled at the level of the theme. So the flash piece doesn't load in, but I just changed this so that now it's just uh, a single link, whereas before So then here's um, one four is too many. But. So this is really pretty powerful for, for our whole system. The ability to have a widget that then can have different formats that are defined in the theme so that our user documentation is just uh, how to insert a post widget. And that's the same across the entire installation. Um, but 
game designers are still allowed to be expressive because we have this ability to create new formats and, uh, and restrict to a certain set of formats so that if they know that the one with the thumbnail looks awful and they haven't done the CSS for it and they don't think it will ever make sense, they can just remove it by filtering it out. Yeah, exactly. And if they want the thumbnail to be a certain size, we can control that in a format. Um, and the thumbnail comes in from, you know, it's attached to the post. Uh, and <coughs> it's using something very similar to the feature image, but it's homegrown. Predates the feature image, so yeah. actually, I think there's some things about it that are a little nicer. So we, I, the wrote, default one is not here. I wrote a way to just create a, a very easy way to. Uh, that's not an image. So, for example, <laughs> I uh, and you can just add it. And it, it, it doesn't, it's not like a, the, the feature image and the add media that's built into WordPress. It's all, it, whether you open it from above the admin or you open it to set the feature image, it's the same. There isn't, it's, it's not something that's context specific. So this is just to kind of look inside. I mean, uh, one thing that we have to deal with a lot is the fact that we're, everything is page centric. So we have, Sites that have thousands of pages, actually. Um, I think the biggest one is maybe 2,500 pages. <coughs> so all the things related to organizing your pages, uh, WordPress doesn't make that really easy. So we have a tool that we use that is a combination of um, the menu structure and the site structure. So it changes not only the uh, menus, but it also changes the URLs. So I can just drag a whole section and move it around. Um, I can put this in a while if you want to, but uh, it's all very easy. Um, and it's done in such a way that this loads very fast because um, when I load the page, I'm only loading the top level pages. And then when I open individual ones, it's an Ajax call out to load the child pages. Um, so anyway. There's a lot of stuff that we've done to try to make it all work for us. But I think for the most part, we're really pretty happy with it. So the last thing I have is that uh, we're hiring. <laughs> um, we're really uh, getting ready to make a huge push into mobile websites. Um, and we have some really big projects that are underway right now. We're redoing all the libraries website and um, um, the View Today, which is uh, it's not a student-run newspaper. It's, it's a, something that's produced by the marketing com communications group that is, is a sort of what's happening on campus kind of thing. Um, that's being moved into WordPress. So, uh, you know, if you're uh, someone that's really interested in writing code and has some serious chops, come up, talk to me, talk to uh, Trevor or, or uh, Ron Ames. But thank you, thank you for coming.